Praise God. It's good to be in God's house. Amen. We're so thankful that you're with us this evening. Praise God. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Would you stand as we do, as we begin this evening? Father, we just give you the praise, the glory, the honor, and, and we thank you, Father, tonight as we come into your presence, Lord, and, and uh, we, just, we just celebrate, Father, uh, your life, God, in each and every one of us. But God, we just, we lift these up to you, Father. We thank you, Father, for Sister Mary and, and all of these, God, the, the praise reports, God, that, Father, we just, we just glorify your name because we know that, Lord, that you are moving, you are working, your will is being done. And, and we just thank you, Father, that you watched over her, Father, Sister Mary, and brought her through this, God. And we just pray that you would just continue to, to finish the work that you have, you have begun in her, Father, in her healing, God. God, that you would raise her up completely. Father, we pray for this family, Father, and, and that has lost a, a loved one, God. The student, Father, the, the class body, and all of those, Father. But I pray that it would cause something in them to be stirred. That, Lord, that they would seek you, look to you, Father, and understand that, God, that life is short. And that, Lord, that we are not in control of how many days that we have. But, Lord, all of those things are in your control. And help us, Father, to count our days and help us to number them, Father. And that, that God, that we may live wisely and in a way, Father, that it's honoring and pleasing to you. We lift up, Father, these uh, each and every one of these families, God. We thank you for uh, Jessica's family and, Father, and all of those, God. God, that uh, as, as a result, Father, of, of a faithful witness, God, your spirit, Father, is moving. And Lord, we, don't, we never know, Father, when the, when the seeds will begin to, 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 to take root, Father, begin to, to grow. But God, you do. And I just thank you, Father, that we see that even now. We pray, Father, for strength in the families, God, for courage, God. We pray, Father, for the fam this family, Father, of, of Janie, Father, that you would be with them, Father, that you, God, would increase, God. Help them, Father, to know you, Lord. Bring them, Father, to, to salvation. Lord, more than anything else, I pray that you would use us as vessels, God, to lead others to salvation, to a saving knowledge, God. Father, knowing, God, the, 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 the dire need, Father, to be in a relationship with you, I pray that, God, that we would not take that for granted, but, Lord, that you would help us and, God, strengthen us in our witness, Holy Spirit, as we do. In the mighty name of Jesus, we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated this evening as we begin. I know we got off. Uh, I started a little bit early. I mean, late. <laughs> early. Uh, and so we're going to we're going to go ahead and get right right on track tonight. Second Kings, Second uh, Kings chapter two tonight is where we're going to begin. Uh, it's something to me as as we begin to see the 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 times in our world and and everything that's taking place. You know, it's it's no surprise to me that um, that we are living in the last days. It's this is not something to me that is that is you know foreign. It's and it shouldn't be to you and I. That's why the Bible says, uh, and we talked about it the last couple of weeks on Sunday to, to encourage one another, uh, and and gathering ourselves together even more so as we see that day approaching because we know that the day of the Lord is at hand, and uh, you know Jesus Christ is coming. His return is very very near. The one thing that's alarming to me, though, is that even though we know this and we see this and we see the signs that are all around, we yet see such an apathy, uh, I believe, in, in so much of, of Christianity that, that it's little heard, it's little, there's little said about it in, in the Christian realm today, that it may be mentioned here and there, but in the mainstream, it seems, uh, of, of Christianity... The second coming of the Lord is, is very seldom talked about, very seldom heard. And uh, we are the vessels that God is going to use. But uh, we need to be aware of our times. We need to be able to see that Jesus Christ is coming. He's coming after a church that is spotless. He's coming after a church, a bride that has made herself ready. And you and I need to be, uh, be in a position to where we allow the Holy Spirit to 
to just take charge. There's no time to play around with, with life and, and, and especially the Word of God. In 2 Kings chapter 2, starting with verse 19, it says, And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord sees. But the water is not, and the ground is barren. Now we, we've read this scripture, <clears throat> these scriptures uh, some, some months ago, just a few months ago, probably even uh, last month or month before. And, and we kind of went into it a little bit, but I'm going to take it from a little bit of a different angle this, this evening. And I'm going to set some groundwork for the, next, uh, for the next few weeks that we're going to be talking about uh, this, this being a, a new cruise. He says, and in verse 20 he says, And he said, Bring me a new cruise, and put salt therein. And they brought it to him, and he went forth unto the spring of the waters, and cast the salt in there, and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. Now, as I said, we, we talked a little bit about this, and, and so I'm just going to deal with it a little bit, and, and then we're going to get right into what uh, we're going to be dealing with. But I want to lay a, bit, a little bit of a foundation you see, just because things look okay doesn't mean that they are okay. First, right out, you know, first and foremost, just because things on the outside look okay doesn't mean they are okay. Remember what Jesus said about the Pharisees? He said, "You whitewash tombs." He says, "Everything on the outside looks good, but on the inside there is still dead men's bones." And can I tell you, that's, that describes a lot of Christians today. They look good on the outside, everything's fixed up, they, they, they know the lingo, everything. And, and this, is, this is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable, as they say. And, and this, is, this is truly, when you, when you and I come to the place, this is truly what is meant by hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is to be an actor, is, is really what hypocrisy is. Now, hypocrisy, some people describe it as, as you know, uh, you make a mistake or whatever. No, I, I'm telling you, it's not just about making a mistake, but it's when it is your character. It's not, it, it's not the exception, it's the rule. And so there are a lot of people that look good on the outside and they act good on the outside, but, but behind closed doors, when nobody else is looking, when everything else is... And then they, they may act like somebody in front of you, but when nobody else is looking, that's who they really are because character is formed when nobody else is around. That's what true character is. When nobody else is around, how do they, who are they? And so, and so a hypocrite was really described as, as someone who was an actor. So they would play a role, but they would. You knew that that wasn't them. I mean, you see somebody on a, on a, on a television screen, and they play several roles. That would actually be called, and not in, in and in not an offensive way. That would be called a hypocrite, an actor. The problem is, is when Christians merely play the role, but inside they're dead. So everything on the outside looked good. But what was happening in, in this time that Elisha was, was brought here was that the land wasn't producing fruit. The livestock was actually miscarriaging. It was, it was even said by, by historians that, that there, was, there was even miscarriages by, by women and, and all kinds of stuff. That, so... so it, they they had they were able to get pregnant, but they didn't have the strength to go through the pregnancy. And so so they said to Elijah, everything looks good on the outside, but but don't let don't let it fool you. Looks can be deceiving, and I pray that that would not be our heart today, because I can tell you this: in one moment, God will God will ultimately reveal who we are. When the rapture takes place, I can tell you this, it'll be revealed who we are. And, and there will be many 
that will say unto him in that day, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, I never knew you. I, but, but I went to church every Sunday. I did all of these things. And he's going to say, I never knew you. So, so Elijah says, okay, well, bring me a new cruise. Because this has to be fixed. The problem has to be fixed. And we can look in our world today, and I can tell you this, the problem has to be fixed. So the problem that, is, that, that has brought death into the church, into the world, and into everything else, everything is a result of the church. The church is the one that sets the stage. And, and, and when Israel failed, the rest of the nation failed. And, and, the, and the peoples around them had, had the power to overcome them. But it was when the church, when the, the people that were called of God... We cannot blame, as the church, we cannot blame what is happening in our world on everybody else that's around us. <laughs> as the body of Christ, as the church, we need to take responsibility because if we don't, how can we repent for something we think that we are not responsible for? Now, I know that that's a little bit of a hard statement and and as we move forward, I, I'm, I'm telling you, these, these are things that you and I have to come to, to, to grips with. We have to come to a place of understanding. Every time in the Word of God when something went wrong, the people of God, uh, the, the men of God, the prophets of God, Jeremiah and Daniel and all of them alike, repented for the things that they had done. They counted themselves with the people. Jesus Himself, He was numbered with the thieves. He was numbered with us. He, and Moses didn't, didn't consider it to something to be a prince, but he, he identified with his slave brethren. You see, it's always as, as, as the people of God have to come to a place where they identify with the people that are around them. And, and, and we are going to be dealing a lot with, you know, really what it is to be an intercessor. To, to tonight and as we move forward, because I, I you know, I, I'm thankful for those of you that, that join us online on Tuesday nights, and I'm thankful for the ones that come in here. But can I tell you this? God has a special calling and something special for you when you begin to truly intercede for other people. When you begin to honestly intercede and pray for other people, there is a special blessing in that. And I couldn't explain it to you in, 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 you know, and do it justice, if you will. But when you and I begin to do the thing that we, that it, that it's hard to do and that there's not an open reward for, from, from the outside and everybody else is congratulating you and everybody is looking at, when you begin to intercede, there is a special reward for that. And, and so in order to, correct the problem, we have to identify ourselves with those we are ministering to. So a general renewal of spiritual life in the day that we live in is so needed. There needs to be a renewal of spiritual life. And this is an area that I think it probably... It, there, there's not many places that, that really rub me. And, 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 you know, maybe I shouldn't say it in that sense because, you know, I've gotten myself in trouble. But it rubs me the wrong way when people talk about revival sometimes. Because we talk a lot about what we don't know. We, we, we speak about things and we give general ideas and... In, in different things, but, but we don't really understand. We know what we're saying, but, but we really don't understand how it works. You see, you can, you can do research on something and you can find out all the information, but if they put the wrench in your hand, and that's the problem. A lot of times we think that knowing is the same thing as possessing or or having. So a spiritual renewal is, is, is very needed in, our, in, in the time that we live in today. There, there needs to be a revival. There has to be a revival. And, and I will say this again and again, that, that re, true revival, in a revival, to, to be revived, it means to be brought to life, to be made alive. And, and that, that little word re, it means to be made alive again. 
means that you're made alive again. You, 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 and, and a lot of times, it, and people don't like to think about it like this, but it, it's because you've backslidden. Because, because you've gotten cold. You were, you were once alive, but you are no longer alive. And, and until you understand that you are no longer alive, you can never be revived. You see, that's what, that's, that's what happens when a person is on the side of the road or has a heart attack or something. They come to revive them. It, they were alive at one point, but now they're trying to bring them back to life. And so, so the only person that can do this is the Holy Spirit in us. And, and I will say this again and again, because you can know what revival is. You can know the definition of revival. You can know all the, 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 the outworkings of revival. You can know what it will produce because you've maybe seen it in the past and you can talk about it and all of these things, but you never know it until you finally experience it. But, and so, so, so here it is. That revival, true revival will never come. And I know I've said this before, and it's so, so this isn't, That new, but true revival will never come until you can you cannot live without it. True revival will never come until you cannot live without it. As long as you can go about your day without true revival, you will never receive it. Because revival doesn't happen by mistake. Revival, you don't stumble across revival. Revival happens on purpose. And that's what I believe that most people don't understand. They're just praying for a revival. They don't know what they're praying for. Send the rain, Lord. Oh, let the latter rain fall. And they'll, and they'll sing. And, they'll, and they have this, they, they, they have this construct of information in their mind and what it's supposed to be like. And so they, they, they get all, you know, emotional. Let your revival fires burn and let the rain fall and let the... But they don't really understand what they're praying for or asking for. And really that's not, that's, that, I mean, yes, that's, it's a good thing, but it's, it's, it's not... Merely going to bring revival just because you sing about it. It's until it comes to a place in your life where you're, you are sick and tired of life as usual. Until life comes to a place where there's no more hope. Until life comes to a place where, there is, where it seems to have no more meaning. It just begins to seem like just a big cycle. You just get up and you do it again. And you just get up and you do it again. And it just comes to that place where it's just like, man, I do this and been doing this for days, months, weeks, years. And it's like everything just seems to be one thing after another. And, nothing. and, then, and, then, and then things begin to change. And, and most revival comes under extreme pressure. Persecution. In this instance, there was death everywhere. And if something didn't change, everyone would eventually die. Do you see it in verse 1? I mean in verse 19? The first verse that we read? And the men of the city said unto Elijah, I pray thee, the situation of the city is pleasant, but my, as my Lord sees, but the water is not, and the ground is barren. The crops are dying. Everything around us, there's, there's, it may look good on the outside, but, but it's just the beginning. And if it continues this way, there's going to be famine. There's not going to be food enough. There's not going to be grain. There's not going to be, there's not going to be cattle. There's not going to be anything to feed us. We are going to die. It starts with the grass. It starts with the, 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 the fields. It starts with the animals. And, and then it begins to come upon the humans and, 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 and up, upon the people. And, and he says, even though it looks okay right now, it is not okay 
And I would say, look around at the world today, and even though it looks like everything is okay, and, and we, we see a few signs here and we see a few signs there, but it hasn't affected us yet. We see, we, we see thousands of people losing their jobs. We see, we see things beginning to, to change. We see Iran. We see, we, we see China and Russia and all of these beginning to, to collaborate their powers. And, and yet there's nothing to see there. You're looking into it. That's all that, you, you know, you, you pay too much time watching the news, Pastor. And you see all of these things that are taking place around in our world and, and, and all the signs are there, but everything looks good. But anybody who has a spiritual bone can, can tell you everything might look okay right now. But death and destruction are on the way. And you say, well, well pastor, how can you say that? Well, because that's what the book of Revelations tells us. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And see, and, and, and you and I have to understand that because God understands and God sees all things at all times and He wrote the future even before the beginning. Before you and I took our first breath, he, he had already finished the story. Before the world had begun, He already knew how it was all going to unfold. And, and the book of Revelation, the book of Apocalypse, uh, Apocalyptos, I, I, I may have gotten that wrong, but, but the, the book of Revelation, it's, that's what it is. It's a revelation. And what God is trying to do through Revelation is to reveal something to you and me. It's not supposed to be, at least for, not for the people of God, a book of ruin, a, a book of destruction, a book of damnation, a book of all of these things that we would think it is. Read it again and you will see all the beautiful things. But if all you can see is the destruction in it, then something's wrong in your spirit and in, and in our spirit. So, so we see the things that are happening. And so what we're to do is we are to make sure that the church is awake. We are to make sure that the church is alive. We are, to, we are here to sound the alarm. We are the watchmen on the walls that are to blow the trumpet and tell the world, this is what's coming. The problem is, is not many churches and not many preachers, not many watchmen are, are on the wall warning those that, that destruction will come upon the land. And unless you serve Jesus Christ, unless you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, I'm not going through the tribulation. You can do that if you want to. But I won't. I'm not, I'm not, I, I was not created for destruction. But many people are because, because there's no one warning. But they don't see the importance in warning people. But Jesus Christ gave us the revelation of these things and the times that are coming. So a general renewal of spiritual life is so necessary right now at this time that we're living in that you and I need to understand there has to be a renewal of life. We have to come alive and we have to come to a place where, where, where we understand the church as a whole. We need a renewal of God's life inside of us. You know, I, I, I like to look at the Word of God, and I can look at the Word of God, and, and, and the Bible tells us that the glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the former house. And we can look at the book of Acts and see what the former house was. But you know, we don't even have to go as far as the book of Acts. All we have to do is go back a, a few decades, if you want, and look at the healing revivals that were under these. And look at the, look at the way that God moved. And look at the, 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 the ministries that God had raised up in that generation. And God says that the glory of the latter house will be greater. There is a need for a renewal of life in us. And God is our life tonight. He is our life tonight. Now to accomplish this, this is where the new cruise, the new vessel has to come in. An instrument conformed to the mind of God. An instrument, someone that is set apart, people, a people that is set apart. See, the Bible says that we are a peculiar people. 
a people that is set apart for one purpose, one mission, and that is to do the, the works of Christ, to do the works of God. And, and I wonder sometimes, is there such a vessel in the earth that is set apart? Because if, if you ask me, you look around a lot of times, and, and by the attitudes, and by the personalities, because, because men are always looking on the outside, and we're not, we're not called to do that. It is God that sees the heart. And so, so, so in order to do this, there has to be a, a, a church that is sanctified or set apart for God, for the use of God. But when, what, what the problem comes is when we, as we've said often, become friends too friendly with the world. And we look at the world and we think that the world is a misunderstood friend rather than an enemy of God. I, I, I can tell you it is, it is becoming clearer and clearer that Christians are hated. And you can ask yourselves, well, why are Christians hated? Because you are set apart for the things of God. Because you don't agree with the things that the world, the, the, the world has and, and what the world says. And, and, as, and as such, as such, because one of the things that has been coming up a lot lately, it, it, and, and, and I will bring up this one, one area right now, is, is abortion. has been coming, it's been in the news a lot lately. Can I tell you this? God is still against abortion. You see, when we look at the God of the Bible and we see who He is, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, and, and some people say, well, well, He's just an angry God. No, he's, he is a just God. He is a loving God. He is a merciful God. He is a gracious God, but He is a righteous God. He is a holy God. And He is not partial holy and partial righteous and partial... No, He's all holy, He's all righteous, and He's completely just in what He does. And so when He sees that, when you and I look at it, look at it we can... And, and as I've often said, we can look at things as long as we're not facing them directly, as long as they are not are affecting us directly, it's easy to turn a blind eye to them. And, I, and, and let, me, let me put it like this, because this happens a lot when we, when we, when we talk about praying for people or, or interceding for someone else. And this is why it has to be effective. This is what it comes down to. True intercession, true effectiveness. You see, we hear, and, and we hear someone, even as we heard this evening, child passing away. And we can stop and we can pray for that person because it's not your child. But when it's your child and you're standing there, I never thought that this could happen to me. You're the one that is devastated. It's not a little two-second prayer that's going to help anything. To intercede is to enter into that person's pain and to really feel what they feel and to, and to actually, actually get into prayer and, and intercede and lift them up and take their need before God because you were set apart to take their needs before the throne of God because you have been given the right and you have been given access because of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit and, and you have the access, but are you using it? You see, and same thing with abortion. Abortion doesn't affect you because it's not happening to you. You're here. And I wonder how some of those people would feel like if, if, if it was happening to them. I, I heard it put this way because they always use the, they always use the, the, the 0.001% of, of, a, a, of an argument to make a whole argument and make it seem like it's the 99% of the argument. And so a lot of times they'll say, well, what if the, pers what if the mother's life is in danger? Again, that's like 0.001%. But that's the that, 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 that takes the majority because that's, that's the only argument they have. Well, reframe, reframe the question, if you will. If your child was in the middle of the street and there was an oncoming vehicle, would you let that vehicle hit them? 
and say their life didn't matter? Or would you be willing to put your life in the way to save theirs? Well, well, well you can't say... Reframe the question. I can tell you every, every mother that I know and every father that I know would, would gladly put themselves in the way to get that child out of the way. And so God sees these things, not like you and I, they are very personal to God. The Bible says so much so that not one sparrow falls to the ground without his understanding, without his noticing it. So when God sees these things, everyone affects Him directly. And such a powerful thing, God feels every emotion. He feels every hurt. He sees everything. And yet, thank God because of Jesus Christ, He doesn't hold those things that we have repented of against us. But there's a world out there that doesn't know anything about re true repentance. And so we talk about revival and we think revival is just a sunny day and it's going to, you know. But it's about being made alive. It's coming to life in Jesus Christ. So the new cruise is an instrument conformed to the mind of God. A vessel through which God can pour Himself in and through to a world. This is the way that God touches the world. He touches the world through you. He touches the world through me. It would be nice for us to look up and say, Well, well, you know, God, just uh, we, 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 you know, we just want you to part the heavens and, and step on down here. And God says, Well, then surrender yourself and I can do it. You see, because, because he gave the authority, again, he gave the authority to Adam. Adam forfeited that authority to Satan when he surrendered to the authority of Satan. And so the only way to take that authority back was to, send, to come in the form of a man, which it was Jesus Christ, who gave his life, poured out his blood, died on a cross so that you and I could now have access and that he could have access to us. And so now that's why the Bible calls us the body of Christ. And that we are here in His stead. That if God wants to do anything in this earth, He's going to use you and me. He's, he's going to use a vessel. And are we being used for the purpose that we've been set apart? Remember that, 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 that sanctification, that being set apart was the same thing as the vessels that were in the temple. The goblets, the cups, the, 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 the bowls, and everything that was in the temple, it was not to be used for anything else. And when the king thought that he could use them for something else, the Bible says that the handwriting was on the wall. You have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Why? Because you used the vessels that were only to be used for the things of God. You used them to try to impress people. And I wonder how many, how many pastors and how many preachers and how many evangelists and how many so-called prophets have used the gifts that God has, has given them for their own glory rather than for the glory of God. And they're going to have to answer to God because you used it for yourself and not for me. And you have been weighed in the balances and you have been found wanting. Many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord. Did not we? And God's not going to say, no, you didn't. Because they did. Did not we cast out devils? Did not we do this? Did not we do that? Did not we do all of these things? And He doesn't argue with what they say that they did. But He says, but you didn't know me. You used the gift for something other than my glory. And see, and so God uses vessels and instruments that are set apart. You say, well, Pastor, I, I, I'm telling you, I, even, even getting ready for all this, I, didn't, I, I wasn't sure how it was going to come out, but there's a, there's, a, there's a desire. And you and I have to understand that this is, this, is, this is real. This is reality. Eternity hangs in the balance. 
And God is looking for you and I as instruments. And we must be an instrument based solely upon the Holy Spirit's order and the Holy Spirit's requirements. You and I don't get to call the shots. He does. It's, it's His way. I, I know. It's His way or the highway. <laughs> and, I, and I say that for this reason. It's His way or the highway because the Bible says broad is the way that leads unto destruction and many there be on it. But straight and narrow is the path that leads to righteousness. And few there be that find it. You see, it's either His way on that path of righteousness or it's the highway that leads right into hell. And, 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 and you know, I get this picture. You ever seen a concert? You ever seen one of them venues where, where everybody's waiting outside and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people, right? And everybody's waiting with anticipation for the doors to open, for the main event to begin. And, and so the doors open. And the people in the front many times get trampled on. Because the people in the back don't know what's going on yet. And you see, and it's, and it's this highway that ends right at the precipice of hell. And it's a cliff. And this, is, this is the vision I get when I think about that highway that that's wide and broad and many there be on it. There are many people that are on that highway and they're, they're right at the edge and, and right when they realize the terror and destruction, they can't stop because everybody behind them is so excited about getting in. And he says many are on that path. And unless you and I become the vessels of righteousness and sanctified, set apart for God. You see, you, we, we, can, we can hear the Word of God, we can be offended by it, or we can hear the Word of God and say, you know what, God, I, wanna, I want my life to mean something. I want to serve a purpose. I want to be effective. I want to be used by you because in the end of all things, eternity, eternity will tell the truth. And eternity is eternity. No end. So we're not suggesting, if you will, an exclusive body. We're not talking about a, 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 a group of people that, uh, you know, I mean, we're better than everybody else. We're not talking about that. We're talking about being a part of the whole body, but coming, coming under the authority of Jesus Christ, under the authority of the Holy Spirit, under the Spirit's orders and requirements. It's not some superior class that it's, it's our four no more. You can't do this. Only we can do this. And you, I, I've seen those people. And it'll make you sick to your stomach. Because God says many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. And I can guarantee you God has put a calling on each and every one of us. And the ones that will be chosen are the ones who choose to answer the call. Many are called, but few will pick up the phone. It must be a solicitor. <laughs> it's, it's God again, and we know what He wants. He wants us to be set apart. He wants us to, you know, sacrifice. He wants us to do all of these things. And, and really, it's because... because there's no love for God, true love for God, that compels us to cry out and to do the things that God has called us to do. As I said, it's not a superior class of people. When we look through history and we see the, 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 the spiritual recovery that has taken place at times, the instruments, the vessels, the people that were used have been always come to a place where they relied upon the Holy Spirit. They were not merely exclusive. They were not isolated. They were pulled out from the Mass.
You and I have to be a representative of the people that we are ministering to or interceding for. In other words, we have to know who we're, who we're representing. Who are we representing before God? Who are we taking to God in prayer? We have to know the people that we're praying for, the ones that we are interceding for. We have to be connected with the rest of the people. It is the body of Christ. It is, it is, it's those of us. It's, so, so our appeal is to God. Our appeal is for the people that we represent. But when we go against God's way of doing things, we destroy our usefulness. But God, I really think that it would, it, we, we, we would do much better if we did it this way. And we need to be very careful about methods and things that we use. We, we do. We just have to. They cannot be ungodly methods because I know that there's a lot of, a, a lot of things that are out there that, that, you know, as long as the ends justifies the means, as long as we get to the right end, it doesn't matter how we get there. But it matters how we get there. It matters how we get there. So we recognize that in the divine purposes of God, that when He wants to do something on the earth, whether it's to renew life, to revive, or to make Himself known, He has to have a vessel. You see, it's the new cruise. Elijah could have said, well, just bring me any old cruise. But it had to be a new cruise. It had to be one that was set apart for the things of God had to be somebody that, 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 that knows their place. I, God's work comes through human instruments. And that cruise, when it was made, it was prepared in fire. It was prepared by the fire. It was hardened by the fire. And, and the trials of this life and the things that you go through are preparing you so that you can be used for the glory of God. So that's why, that's why we, don't, we, we, we don't have to... We, we shouldn't be arguing or fighting over or, or complaining. Paul says, I'd rather glory in my infirmities and in my persecutions and my trials and in my despair and... Because when I'm weak, then His strength is made perfect in me. You see, don't, don't think the light affliction that you're facing right now is going to outweigh the glory of, that, that, that will be revealed in you. And see, Satan will, will, will try to use these things to destroy you and to destroy your usefulness or to, to get you off of track. But what Satan doesn't understand and what Satan doesn't realize many times is he's actually being used to prepare you for the calling that God has for you. And the things that Satan meant for evil, God is going to use it for your good and His glory, praise God. See, the, the hard things, the trials, the things that you are under today, the things that you are facing, the difficulties that you are going through, the accusations that others are bringing against you. The, the, say, the Bible tells, tells us that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, always bringing your name up. And always accusing you before God and always trying to accuse you before men or bring men to accuse you. What is he doing? He's trying to destroy you, but what he doesn't realize that if you will humble yourself and just do it God's way, God will use the very thing that Satan is trying to destroy you with to strengthen you and to make you the person that he can use mightily through him. And if God be for you, come on somebody, who can be against you? Under the direction of the Holy Spirit, we, we become that vessel of God bringing new life into the church and, and, and being that instrument. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I want to be that instrument. 
So when we understand that we are the representatives of the church, of the body, you see, it has to come through somebody that's connected to the body. So, so, so you're representative, but you're also related to, to, to the purpose of God. God is using you for a purpose because you represent His body. Then God can use you and I to, bring reco- to recover the life that has been lost. When we begin to look back through history and we understand and we look, look at Esther, she represents an instrument brought to the throne. As the Bible says, the famous line, for such a time as this. It wasn't easy for Esther to be be brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. She was brought to a place where she had to make a, a decision and a choice. She was in the palace. She was part of the Jews. She was part of the Israelite nation. She was part of them. So the reason why God was going to use her because she was representative of them. But He wanted to use her for His glory. So Esther had a choice. And and she even brought it before Mordecai. And she she just wasn't sure because it it was a dangerous thing. And she kind of liked being in the palace. And she kind of liked, you know, all the, the, the preferential treatment, if you will. And so she says, so what if I don't do this thing, basically? And Mordecai says to her, well, whether you do this or not, God will bring deliverance from somebody, but don't think that you're going to escape it. He will find a vessel. See, and and, and I believe that we are at that place, that point, even this evening as as we hear the Word of God. You and I are at a point. You can, you can choose to, to forget the, the persecution. You know what? I, I, I just really don't want to live a life that I feel might be restricted, even though it won't, because that's what the enemy wants you to believe. He doesn't, he, he doesn't want you to fulfill and, and, and be fulfilled with more purpose than you and I could have ever thought or dreamed of. And so he tries to say, well, if you do this, you're going to, you're going to lose out. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna waste time. You could be doing a lot of other things. You could, you could be wealthy. You could do this. You could do that. And you do that. And and he says, so so do you really want to? And see, and Esther was Esther was at that point. She was like, I could just stay in the palace, and everything will be good. And Mordecai said, you can make that decision, but don't think that you're going to escape the judgment that's coming. God will bring up another vessel but it's up to you if you want to be it. And I believe he asks you and I that very same question. I will bring somebody up to glorify my name, to represent me. I'm just asking if you want to be the one. See, the occasion that Esther was thrown into was a satanic plot for God's people. Because the people of God represented Him. Don't you remember what Moses said? He says the only thing that sets us apart from everyone else in the the world is your presence. God loved the Israelite people so much because because it was was Abraham that believed God. And because of Abraham, God put seed on the earth. And, And through Abraham, He birthed the nation. And that nation represented Him. Moses became a deliverer of that nation. And Joshua continued the, 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 the legacy forward. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people of Israel were a representation of God in, in the world, in the earth. And Satan, to this day, does not want to recognize them and wants to annihilate them. Do we not see that? Even now, in, the, in, in Israel, they are surrounded by the Islamic nations, the Arab nations. 
They don't want to recognize who they are. And they would just have it push them off into the Mediterranean Sea and be done with them. And we can ignore it and say, well, that's, that's not really happening, is it? No, it, it's happening. And, and that's why when, and, and you know, I mean, all of these things, I, I don't even want to really get into all these things, but it just, it's just one thing leads to another. That's why, that's why when we made the, the, the deal with Iran for the nuclear, for the nuclear weapons and, the, and, and, and all, can I tell you this? It's like putting a bomb, a nuclear weapon, in the hands of a suicide bomber. What's going to stop him from, if he gets the chance? You see, it's always been against Israel. And, and what is it? It is a satanic, demonic attack against the people of God. And because you and I are the church, the, the body of Christ, there is a satanic and a demonic attack against you and I trying to derail us, trying to cause us to give up, walk away and quit. And God's telling you and I, will you be the vessel that I can use? And I believe that that's the question tonight. Her life represented the whole of Israel. Just like your life will represent the whole of the church. Although they were in captivity and she was in the palace, it didn't matter how privileged or exalted Esther may have seen, seemed. God put her there for such a time as this. Don't think that God doesn't know where you're at. He's put you right where He wants you for such a time as this. And the question comes, will we receive the calling and become the vessel that He desires to use? And this is just, we, 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 only, we could only put down the foundation tonight and we'll unfold as we go further and deeper as we move forward. But uh, I, I really believe that we're closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ than we even know. I believe Jesus Christ is, will return and His return is imminent at any moment it could take place. Nothing holding it back. But I do believe that there's going to be a revival and whatever time is left, may we be effective in being used for the glory of God. Father, tonight as we internalize your word, we don't want to be just hearers, but God help us, Holy Spirit, to be doers. Help us not to be, even as you spoke of the Pharisees, hypocrites, actors, or whitewashed tombs where we look good on the outside, but the inside is dead men's bones. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help, help us to be revived. Help us to understand that, Lord, the, the world that we're living in, the times that we're living in, they're dire. And Lord, even though sometimes we feel like, God, um, the role that we might play may be so insignificant, may we never put that label on ourselves. But may we just, even as the, as the young boy father with his fish and loaves, trust you with what we have and leave it up to you to touch the multitudes as we just surrender. I pray that God that you would you would move mightily in your people. And that Lord that we would not sell you out. But God, we wouldn't try to limit you. We wouldn't we wouldn't try to hold your hand back. But Lord, and I pray that we would come to that place that no matter what our mind is trying to think up or trying to think of all the, the reasons why we shouldn't. I pray that we would come to that place even as you came in the garden, that nevertheless, 
not my will, but your will be done. God, help us. Help us to truly care about those that are around us that we minister to, whether it's at home, in our workplace, at school, wherever it may be. I pray that, God, that we would not be blind to the needs that are before us. But, God, we would, we would, Holy Spirit, wake us up so that we can truly pray and intercede for those that are around us. And that, Lord, that we would see working in us and through us for the glory and the honor of your name. That, Lord, that when we stand before you, Lord, the, the greatest reward will be to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the, to the glories. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would, you would help us. And that, Lord, as we surrender under your hand and submit to you, that you would reveal that it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And we just put it in your hands tonight, Father. And I just pray that, God, that each and every person that's listening online, that's sitting in this place tonight, or that will hear this, will hear the call and pick up the phone and answer God. We ask it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. To you be the glory and the honor. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, thank you for being here with us. Amen. Tonight. And, and may we always take seriously the things of God and, and never put them in that category of just normal, everyday stuff. Um, these, these things are important and, and should res deserve that, that, that attention. Um, love you and God bless you and thank you again for your faithfulness. Uh, for those of you that are watching, you can still give online. We couldn't do the, what we're doing without you. And uh, if you came ready, Mario's standing there. But thank you again for your faithfulness. And, uh, you know, this Sunday, it was, it was so exciting. We, we picked up a couple more missionaries and we're going, we're looking at, uh, at also some uh, missions in, in Israel. And so uh, as that comes to uh, fruition, we, we'll we'll let you in on it. It's so exciting because we know that God is God is doing it, and you know that that's the one thing. And I just want to share that with you. That one thing that we've we've been able to do every year is increase our giving for missions, and and as a result, God has just continued to increase uh, everything that we do in in our effectiveness, and and it's only because of your faithfulness and your obedience to him that we are able to do it. And so thank you again, but love you and God bless you in Jesus name. Amen.